much for joining us. I'm really excited to have you. No, it's exciting to be back in person. And I, I really appreciate everybody coming in today. I'm excited to have this online audience as well. And we're going to be talking about something that's extraordinarily important, having an extraordinarily important conversation for a time, what we're calling meeting the moment, accelerating innovation in the decade of action. What it's really about is discussing how we can harness innovation at scale. And how can we do so to address some of the most pressing issues of our time? As you know, we're working on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030, which we have a major shortfall in achieving. And many of you may know it's a $135 trillion shortfall, which I would agree with all of you if you were to say that's that and not. It's also an opportunity, and it's an opportunity that we want to talk about today. It's an opportunity to, to work at harnessing unrealized solutions around the world, through the eyes of entrepreneurs and innovators who are working in the places where the sustainable development goals mean the most. Right? It's our opportunity to work at harnessing the power and empowering individuals who are uh, full of insightful of the needs and also have the tools to provide the solutions that we need to provide that are currently dying in line because we don't have the private and public capital that we need to support those solutions. In addition to that shortfall, in the last couple of years alone, because of the pandemic and global conflict, we've also seen that we're backsliding on the progress we've made. A hundred million more people that are in extreme poverty than they were before the pandemic started. 210 million people who are now vulnerable to food insecurity. So what are we going to do about it? thought here today is to discuss how we can flip the paradigm on its head. Half of the world's population owns only 2% of the wealth. These are individuals, as I said, who are the most in need of us in achieving the sustainable development goals. They're also individuals who are the most knowledgeable about what it will take to make those goals happen. They're individuals that have access and if they have the right access to the capital, they have the right access to the solutions that, that are, would be needed. So the question really then becomes, what if we equipped those creative minds with all the tools they need to design locally relevant solutions to the problems that we're facing? What if those creative minds had right, the right access to capital, also support at the right time, so that we could make these ideas into a reality? And what if we could take these ideas not only to the communities where they live, but then take those ideas to scale and to every community that also needs those same solutions. Over the last 50 years, Commonics has experienced firsthand the power of supporting local entrepreneurship and innovation. What we know from our work is that the barriers that are faced by those individuals who have those solutions are easy to overcome if we put our minds to it and we really focus our efforts with local communities and local entrepreneurs. We're going to hear from a couple this morning, uh, individuals who are working to democratize access to water, to empower young women. And we're going to bring together a group of experts to share how they're driving innovation at scale following this. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. I think it's important for us to really get together as a community and begin working through how we address this staggering shortfall, and how do we encourage our incredible guests and social entrepreneurs uh, that we have with us to share the insights that they have so that we can take those insights to scale in all the work we do every day. Together, I know we can meet the moment, and I'm sure that we can harness the power of the ingenuity throughout the world and create a brighter future for all of us in, down the road. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first social entrepreneur. Uh, she's from Bangladesh, and she's one of our next-gen innovators that's represented through our Unleash Plus program. Our Unleash Plus program is a program that Commonix supports. 
It's an incubator uh, six-month program. It's co-hosted by Unleashed Global Innovation Lab and Chemonix, supporting young social entrepreneurs from around the world working on sustainable solutions to address the SDGs. So I will introduce uh, Sab Sabira, who's not with us today. She's going to come through a video. She's founder and CEO of Wonder Woman, which is an awesome app. It's an awesome idea that we uh, were able to listen to her pitch a couple years ago and support as an organization. It's a platform dedicated to breaking social stigmas for female travelers in South Asia. Uh, it's a tech solution offering safe and affordable travel opportunities for women. And it's also, and I think this is important, a scalable solution that can meet the millions and tens of millions of people uh, that that app can help support. So I'm excited to have Sabira give her pitch to you today. Hello, everyone. I'm Sabira Mehrit Saba, the founder and CEO of Wonder Woman a travel company that is dedicated to female travel enthusiasts of Bangladesh and making sure that we are providing women vetted information, connecting them with like-minded travelers and hosting curated guided tours all over the world. Right now, we are serving 37,000 plus Bangladeshi women all over the world and in 87 plus countries. We are building 100 plus trip leaders as women and making sure that more and more leaders are being created in tourism industry. We are changing the norm and how women are actively participating and making sure that they are being able to mobilize in a safe, hassle-free and affordable manner. This is what Wonder Woman tries to ensure. I started this because in 2014, I was not allowed to travel because I'm a woman. I was not given the permission from my family because of the safety concerns and they didn't allow me to travel to Seattle for a business case competition. This is where I realized that gender plays a strong role because two of my male team members flew, but I didn't. And that's when I realized that this is not a problem just of my own. 80 million plus Bangladeshi women are here in this country and where most of the women, 7 out of 10, when I did the research, I figured out that they are not allowed to travel because of the safety concerns and the social stigma. So I created this community in 2017, keeping in mind that we can provide them the guidance and all support that they require to ensure that they can travel in a safe and hassle-free manner. We have a team of 20 staggering you know, talented women who have the passion to travel and they have the expertise. And we have received the grants from Chemonix International and made sure that we can grow and scale it up and have hubs all over the country. And this is why we envision a world where women can travel fearlessly and freely. Thank you, everyone. So like I said, we were able to see Sabira's pitch at one of our Unleash events in an organization that we uh, host as, uh, as an organization, Commodics. And I think you'll agree, it's just a tremendous, tremendous entrepreneurial venture. And she's since gone on to uh, work with the Extreme Tech Challenge and others in continuing to grow that venture and to continue to work towards scale uh, and, and bringing it to the millions and tens of millions of people that can benefit from it in order, again, to contribute to the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. So with that, we're going to hear from our next social entrepreneur, Tatiana Estevez. I first met Tatiana, uh, who's the CEO of Permolution uh, in Shenzhen, China, where we had our pitch event. Come on stage. Uh, she leads a Canadian-Mexican tech company that uses fog to revolutionize where we get our water from, particularly in Latin America, uh, where access to such a critical resource is lacking. So. Please, Tatiana. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, according to the UN, by 2030, two thirds of the population will not have enough water to cover their needs. And only in the US, drought has cost over $250 billion. I am the founder and CEO of Permolution, a startup working on fog and cloud water collection technology and innovation. We are on a mission to introduce a new water source with our world-class technology, the Fog Atlas, the water radar, and the fog collectors. It is the only technology in the market able, I'm sorry, IoT integrated, uh, ready to assemble, and capable of uh, producing from 150 to 400 liters of water per day per unit. 
Uh, we are cheaper than desalination plants. We are more efficient than rainwater and we're safer than groundwater extraction. Uh, so far, we have deployed projects in agriculture, wildfire mitigation, conservation, and climate change observation. Um, so far, since Unleash uh, in 2019, uh, we have raised $117,000 in non dilutive funding. We have raised 250k in uh, pre-seed investment. And right now, we're transitioning into um, water utility service provider, adopting our recurrent revenue model. Um, we are also setting up a production plant near Quebec. And yes, if we can introduce fog and cloud as a new water source, we can count on a new substantial solution to address our current challenges in terms of climate adaptation and water access. So the answer is fog. Thank you. So thank you to Tatiana. Thank you to Sabira for providing those uh, summaries of their startups. I think you'll agree they're incredible. I'd like to welcome you on stage and we are uh, to have a chair here and we can talk a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur. Um, so let me just start by saying thank you again for coming. I, I'm really interested to hear more about what inspired you to harvest fog. I've read that 1.6 billion people are going to be uh, lacking access to water. I know it's a, a critical issue. I wanna, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your firsthand experience and when you had this insight to create your startup. Yeah, so um, I graduated from the University of Ottawa, and uh, as I graduated, it was always my dream to go backpacking in the U.S., uh, in California in particularly. So that's where I left, and it was the first time ever that I, I experienced a drought situation. It was shocking for me to learn that the U.S. had lost over $250 billion because of the drought, but it was even more shocking for me to learn that farmers were taking their lives because of the irrigation cuts and the economic losses. Uh, so I was with all these heavy thoughts in my head. I looked out the window and I couldn't see anything uh, because of the fog. And that was a little bit the eureka moment where I said, OK, so technically clouds and fog are tons of liters of water that pass above our heads. What are we doing with that? Um, so rain is vertical precipitation and fog and clouds, it's horizontal precipitation. So that's where the journey started. So then you had that moment. Tell us a little bit then about how you took that insight and turned it into a startup. What was the moment you, you knew you were going to go all in and, and take that risk? So even though in California I had the idea and I was able to bounce it around with a, a few communities, women in sustainability, clean tech, accelerators, uh, it wasn't until three years later, uh, I actually put that idea into a, a drawer. Uh, I said, okay, maybe it's not the time to, to start with this. Uh, it was very hard as a Canadian to launch a pilot project with municipalities or achieving grants, uh, not being uh, from the U.S. So three years after, uh, I was working for the government of Canada in Mexico uh, for a sustainable cities project. I was talking about uh, I, I gave a, a conference in a nature, nature science museum about all the clean tech projects I had worked on. And there was the secretary of sustainable development of uh, the Nayarit state of Mexico. And they approached me and they say, hey, we're really interested in the fog thing that you were talking about. Uh, we're actually 80% of the year exposed to fog and we are experiencing really severe drought especially in our natural protected areas where there is a lot of wildfires and many there's a lot of native uh, flora that it's going extinct because of it. Uh, so they open all the doors, all the resources, and that's where I said, okay, so there is uh, someone we can help that nobody else, we're doing something that nobody else is able to do. So that's where we started uh, in 2018 again. Just in 2018. So now you've started your your... You've taken your idea to a business plan and you kind of hinted at this. What were some of the initial reactions that people had when you looked for funding or when you pitched your idea to get it off the ground? And what were some of the barriers that you also uh, encountered as, as a new entrepreneur? So I would say that people have an image already set of what a CEO uh, or a clean tech founder would look like. So the first projects and the first pitches I would do they would always ask me, okay, so when is your boss coming? So when is the actual owner of the company, when is he coming? Uh, and after repeating several times, this is me, this is all you're getting. I can bring my dad if you want a male figure, but 
this this is what a CEO and founder looks like in in 2020 and so on. So that was a little bit uh, a barrier at first, but then when people start to look at uh, what we're able to achieve and what we bring to the table as a very diverse team, uh, they embrace it after. But yes, it was a bit of a barrier at first. So I was really excited to see you and your team uh, when we met in Shenzhen and you did your pitch. I heard a lot about, as we all have now, uh, the technology. I'm curious to hear more about what are the aspirations you have knowing where you're at now for this startup and uh, with the, the breakthrough that you've had with this new technology? So the big dream for me is using this technology um, even further than water access. Um, like I mentioned, well, we have a three, a, a unit of three, a system of three units, sorry, that allows us to collect this water source. First is the fog atlas. It's a predictive model that allows us to pinpoint where the equation of fog meets for us to collect it. And we've done uh, a lot of discoveries in terms of where we could place a significant and uh, substantial water source around the world. So we can uh, place communities, applications, and other um, solutions uh, that for communities and populations that are experiencing displacement, uh, climate change adaptation needs, and so on. So we can actually uh, look at the world with a new water source, uh, hotspots around the world. So that it's very exciting, and we really look forward to making that happen. So we want to support you in making that happen. And, and I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the support you've received that's been meaningful to date, and then the types of things you think you'll need as you move into the future to make that aspiration a reality. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of the support that we got at first, yes, the government of Mexico was very open. They had this great need and uh, the, the that was the first project we installed. It's still alive. It's still expanding. Uh, we're introducing about 150 units of native plants that are on the brink of extinction back into their ecosystem. Um, and with that project, we were invited to Unleash Plus. Uh, with that validation and with that support, we were able, able to leverage other types of support, other types of funding, other types of validation that made us grow even more. So I would say now we're more on the company side than on a startup side. Um, so that has been great. And yes, when people actually see the water flowing and uh, sometimes it looks like magic or they cannot conceive how we are collecting the uh, droplets that are suspended in the air that make up the fog or the clouds, uh, it, is, uh, it is quite exciting and very inspiring um, to see people motivated to, to say, okay, we do have a water source that we can tap into. That's exciting. So we're about to welcome up a panel here on stage of individuals that are supporting social entrepreneurs like yourself uh, through a variety of stages of, of their journey. Um, what would you like them to hear from you about the most critical things that people like yourself need as you go through that journey to help us meet that moment that we're in right now? So I would like them to know that innovation uh, comes from diversity, or I'd like to say diversity is the seed of innovation. So be open to what a founder CEO might look like uh, uh, as, uh, as contrary of what we might have an image of. Um, and yes, uh, exceptional solutions require exceptional people and diverse solutions also require diverse uh, people running them. So to give a chance to those uh, who have the dream, who have the drive, and you will be very surprised by what you can achieve by supporting us. Thank you so much. <laughs> we deserved a round of applause for you and Sabira and others like you who are helping us again to recognize that we have this $135 trillion gap to reaching the SDGs. Uh, it's extraordinarily important at this moment that we find thousands and ten, tens of thousands of entrepreneurs like you uh, to be able to uh, support and, and harness the power of your ingenuity. And, and as we're thinking about that, uh, we're going to welcome up a, a panel led by Lauren Baer, who's our Senior Advisor for Innovation and Investment, and talk a little bit more generally about how we can take these types of insights, solutions, entrepreneurship, and energy and by the way, uh, really inspirational risk-taking that you're doing 
uh, in order for all of us to benefit as humanity in, in realizing these, these SDGs. So thank you for taking the time, Tatiana. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you to Sabira. Let me uh, step away here and, and welcome Lauren Baer then. Thank you. Um, we have Richard Crispin, CEO of Collaborate Up, uh, Elizabeth Festus, our Deputy Chief of Party of the Moldova, Moldova Future Activities, Technology Activities uh, Program implemented by Commonix, Grace Kim, Senior Program Manager at USAID's Development Innovation Ventures, and Victoria Slipkoff, um, the Executive Managing Director of Extreme Tech Challenge and Head of Ecosystem at Walden Catalyst Management. So in the second half of our program, we'll be exploring the ways that the public and private sectors can be working to address the barriers identified by next-gen innovators like Tatiana and Sabir. So to get us started, Richard, um, I would love to start with you to set the stage for this discussion by understanding how we can involve local innovators in designing solutions to sustainability and development challenges from the outset. Terrific. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Commodix, for having us today. Uh, so I was in Botswana a few weeks ago for a commodities project called Guga Now that we uh, are uh, sub under, and I was talking to a guy named Doc Mabila. And Doc, if you don't know him, is a former soccer star in South Africa, stepped away from the game, and now spends his time going around Southern Africa trying to help young, poor black men live out their lives and live out their dreams. And I asked a version of your question of Doc. I asked him, I said, Doc, how can we get young, innovative people to help us with biodiversity, because that's what Luca now is about. It's including biodiversity in Southern Africa. And Doc looked at me and he said, in front of a room like this, he said, Richard, that's third date talk. That's not first date talk. And I said, well, what do you mean, Doc? And he said, well, you can't, if you're trying to woo me, you can't start with what you care about. You have to start with what I care about. And then you can bridge into what you want to talk about. But you have to first start to get to know us. You have to understand what our concerns are, what our needs are. And I was reflecting on what Tatiana said and trying to understand, like, how do we help young under innovators get access and that they don't actually look like me? They don't look like a PhD. I, got, I don't have a PhD, but they don't look like a white guys with PhDs. They look like Tatiana or they look like Doc or they look like young, innovative people who in our highly technical fields that USAID and a lot of philanthropists work in, we are not used to looking in those corners. We are used to looking for highly educated, uh, people who have traditional credentials. And instead, we need to really think about how we can reach beyond that. So I want to leave you very quickly with a principle, a practice, and a tactic. The principle is to be curious. Go out, spend time in the communities, and understand what their concerns are, what their needs are, because you know what? They know them better than we do. The practice is to really try to understand who in those communities are the keys to finding those innovators and uh, who understands the problems the best. That sounds really easy, but it's super hard because we're coming into these communities oftentimes as strangers. So we need to come in with people that they know, that they trust, and figure out how we can find out where those problems are. 
And the tactic that I'll leave you with is that we need to get beyond the English language. We need to be able to speak in local languages, engage people in their languages, not just literally in their language, but also in terms that they understand, not in the terms that we in the donor community understand. Does that help? Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that analogy. Grace, this next question is for you. Development Innovation Ventures is an open innovation program that funds breakthrough solutions, the world's most intractable development challenges. Can you tell us some of the ways that DIV tries to eliminate barriers for local innovators in emerging and developing economies? Thanks for the question. Um, and I think it kind of speaks to what Tatiana had mentioned about, um, you know, where the innovations come from. So Development Innovation Ventures, like we like to say that we are the front door, the open door to USAID. Uh, we fund uh, innovation, innovative solutions from anyone and anywhere. So some funds have a citizenship requirement or a sector requirement or a geographic requirement, but we actually accept applications from anyone from anywhere. Um, and we are sector agnostic. So the nine major sectors that USAID works in all over in 80 plus countries, those are the, we accept applications from all of those. So we are all generalists. Uh, sometimes I'm talking to a sanitation uh, uh, innovator. And then, you know, the next meeting uh, in the same day would be something on agriculture or health or education. So, um, yeah, anyone from anywhere, 50% uh, of our um, grantees have never received funding from USAID both prior to getting a DIV grant. And about 10% of our innovators, uh, our grantees, are citizens of the country where their program is being implemented in. So we try to really... Um, Stay, stay true to the anyone from anywhere uh, concept. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Moldova. You lead a dynamic USA funded program that is enhancing the competitiveness of Moldova's growing technology and digital sectors. Can you tell us about some of the ways the program is enabling localization and how that support is expected to help transform the country's economy? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so, as Lauren said, I'm Elizabeth Vestas. I'm the Deputy Chief of Party for the Future Technologies Activity in Moldova. We're funded by both USAID and Sweden. And uh, our project works in five technology-driven sectors, IT, engineering, light industry, digital media, and creative services. But we also focus on horizontal transformation across the entire economy for digitalization through green practices and sustainability, and also through innovation and creativity. And uh, what's really unique and exciting about this uh, project is that it builds on more than a decade of USAID and other donor programming for sector competitiveness. And that long-term view has allowed us to approach localization in a really unique way. So because our team and because um, the donor teams have established trust and relationships and have be created long-term strategies in these sectors, we're able to fully embrace the principles of co-design and co-creation with local partners. So FTA, as we call ourselves, we rarely do any standalone uh, initiatives or programs on our own. Everything that we do is with uh, local or international partners. And so we are able to bring in business associations, uh, innovation centers, universities, um, different uh, government uh, entities, uh, ministries, agencies, and even big international uh, players who are on the ground in Moldova and co-create different programs together that fit both of our um, goals so that um, what we're creating is truly getting buy-in from different stakeholders. It's sustainable and it's able to, to create long-term change. One example I'll give you is that uh, last year, in the first year of our project, we launched the MediaCorps Digital Media Center, which is housed on the campus of the State University of Moldova. This is a uh, multi-floor, huge physical center that um, houses pre-production, production, and post-production spaces and equipment, and houses. And will and we're in the process of creating educational programs, business development programs, and technology programs in partnership with the Creative Industry Association of Moldova, in partnership with the Ministries of Culture and Education, and with um, the uh, State University of Moldova. And this was also funded by three different donors, USAID, um, 
UK aid and Sweden, as well as the US embassy. So really bringing together all those different stakeholders to create uh, one concerted effort around developing the digital media sector of Moldova in a sustainable way. Thanks so much, I appreciate that. Um, this next question is for Victoria. So Extreme Tech Challenge is the nonprofit behind the world's largest startup competition for entrepreneurs addressing global challenges. You've received more than 5,000 applications from innovators in 100 countries over the seven years since you launched. Can you tell us how XTC evaluates the startups that apply to its competitions and what from your, from your perspective makes an innovation investable? Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me and thank you. We really value our partnership with Humotics. Um, so as you mentioned, Extreme Tech Challenge or XTC, we're the world's largest startup competition ecosystems uh, for entrepreneurs addressing the, 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 the sustainable development goals. Um, so really, we like to think of ourselves as the world's largest marketplace for innovation. Um, so in terms of how we evaluate companies, we receive 5,000 applications um, per year and from across 100 countries. And uh, what's really unique about XCC is that we cover every technology vertical that you can think of, from advanced materials to ag tech, food tech, um, clean tech and energy, fintech, ed tech, um, you know, all sorts of the sectors uh, underneath healthcare, you know, therapeutics, digital health, medical devices, all the way to mobility, sustainable smart cities, circular economy, um, and also Web3 um, and more. So it's, 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 it's a huge platform that grows very fast, and we're also stage agnostic. Um, so then that's a great question. How do we evaluate these companies? We really take the, um, you know, how VCs are looking at these companies. So four different criteria. One is team. You know, uh, is this team uh, equipped and have the domain expertise to build this company? Do they understand the problems that they're solving? Do they understand the pain points? Um, have they shown prior history of success of, 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 of building and scaling companies? So that's one. Ultimately, it's all about the people that are involved. Um, second is product innovation. Um, how innovative is the solution? Um, and and you know, how is this comparing against um, other solutions on the market? Uh, third is product market fit. Uh, do we have evidence to show that the market is uh, buying this product or are they acquiring users, whether it's paid or unpaid? Um, so that's really, really important is, you know, do you see traction of the solution moving forward and, and, and getting used? And last is the tech for good metric. Um, is really you know, how t how this technology can impact and create create a better world. And we really think that um, the company has to be self-sustaining. They have to have a, a, a proven um, or on the way to developing proven business model, revenue model, because ultimately the companies that can scale can make the, the big impact that we wish they can. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Victoria. Building on the point that Elizabeth raised about the, just the diversity of uh, stakeholders and how important that is, um, XTC has built a, a truly incredible network of over 75 partners that support early stage tech entrepreneurs from around the world. And since 2015, XTC finalists have gone on to raise $3.4 billion. In your experience, what has been the key to engaging the private sector and the investment community and investing in solutions that address the SDGs? So XTC is it's such a great community that we are at the nexus of all stakeholders from obviously entrepreneurs, uh, corporations, uh, formal partnerships around 100, but informally we work with um, you know, global 1,000 companies globally, and, um, and then we work with policymakers, uh, ecosystem builders like university incubators, accelerators, um, NGOs and IGOs, and also large tech conferences globally. Um, so, you know, how do we look at uh, public-private partnerships? How do we make sure we can engage the private sector to invest? I would say first finding these great companies um, so XCC is the world's largest marketplace for innovation. Uh, this is the most efficient way for companies that are interested in investing and supporting uh, these startups to find the startup that they're looking for. So we can't do this alone. You know, we work with our stakeholders, uh, you know, regional partners to, to find these promising companies. And then we bubble up to the main extreme tech challenge competition. Um, and also going back to the prior point, I think then how do you facilitate the engagement? How do you make sure investment happen is that um, these companies, uh, they have to work towards satisfying those four criteria I mentioned, right? So team, product market fit, product innovation, and tech for good. Because ultimately, it comes down to companies with 
uh, a robust business model leading to a revenue model um, that you know they can ultimately become category defining businesses that can uh, make a global impact and therefore would be very attractive to the private sector investors. Thank you. We know that private sector engagement is a huge key towards scale of local solutions. So Elizabeth, coming back to your day-to-day -day experience working with innovators and entrepreneurs on the ground in Moldova, what challenges do you encounter when trying to broker those partnerships or facilitate investment funding for promising innovations? And what strategy has FDA used to find that shared value with partners that solidifies their commitment? Yeah, so one, one stream of our work is to develop the entrepreneurship ecosystem in, in Moldova, which is pretty nascent at this point. And uh, entrepreneurs and startups in Moldova face many of the challenges that, that they do all over the world. But there are also really specific challenges in Moldova as well. There's a lack of entrepreneurship mindset and skills development program. So there's now with uh, the war next door in Ukraine, there's a huge... Uh, risk element, especially for investors, and so that has added new challenges to to being to leading a startup or to being an innovator uh, at the moment. In Moldova, you also have a, a tiny market, so anything that you do has to be designed for export, and you have to do a lot of legwork to try and reach um, international connections and investors. So. What we do at FTA is to really take a, uh, an ecosystem approach to these challenges, addressing all of them with, with uh, different tailored interventions and, uh, as I said before, always with partners. So uh, we're addressing them in a, in a variety of ways. Um, for example, and, and I would say those ways are often driven by looking at international and regional examples and trying to tailor them to Moldova. So um, we've partnered with uh, UC Berkeley's uh, Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, and we're working with them to design new entrepreneurship uh, programs to integrate into uh, public universities at Moldova to start uh, creating entrepreneurship skills and mindsets um, starting at university level. We've also partnered with UC Berkeley's Executive Education um, school to create a product management studio course uh, for our uh, CEOs and executives at IT companies, Korea tech companies, to help them push beyond the outsourcing of IT that is very prominent in Moldova right now and start moving into product development and really additional value in, in the products and services that they're developing. Uh, we also worked with the Ministry of Economy to create a new startup and innovation fund that gives small-scale grants to new startups and innovators looking to either create a business or create a new product. And this was based on the design of a Ukrainian startup fund that our team went and met with their team, understood how theirs worked, and then worked with our partners to tailor it to what Moldova needed and, and what its um, innovators needed. We're also working with uh, the country of Estonia through the Estonian Development Cooperation uh, on doing some um, support for Moldova's incubators and accelerators, helping them to tailor their services so that they're not just cycling through different, um, different startups, but really providing niche services that are going to help those businesses take the next step. And finally, we're exploring how to create more financial products for, for startups and entrepreneurs because uh, right now there's a lot of debt financing, but it's very expensive. Interest rates have gone up substantially, and as have um, the inflation rate right now in Moldova is over, I think, 35%. So the, uh, the lack of you know, equity financing, the lack of uh, venture capital is really, really acute, and it's something that we're trying to find new partners for to, to push forward on. So we're really looking at it from a full ecosystem approach and uh, pursuing our, um, our partnerships and localization to try and find solutions. Thanks. Those were some excellent examples of private sector engagement and also touching on the role of the public sector as well. So Grace, I wanted to come back to you um, and your work at USAID about how the public sector can help de-risk innovation when it is in the early stages of pilot launch and scale. What role does it play in closing the financing gap that we heard um, Elizabeth just talking about? Um, so with development innovation ventures, we have three stages of funding. So stage one is up to $200,000 and it's for it's, it's funding to get um, social entrepreneurs or even nonprofits that have a, any kind of product service uh, or a technology that they're trying to deliver, right, um, 
to do the initial piloting and to check, to test like market viability and things like that. Um, product market fit, obviously, um, is art, you know, does the solution work? Right. And, um, are there people who are going to use it? Right. Um, and does it solve some sort of problem? Um, and so stage two funding is up to 1.5 million. That's positioning, uh, an, an, innova an innovation for scale. And then stage three is up to $15 million. We have not given out a $15 million award yet. Um, but typically our stage three um, funding is around anything above 1.5 to $5 million. And that's actually to support um, an innovation to, to, to actually scale, like nationwide or in a particular geographic re region. So our funding is grant funding. It's, it's not debt. It's not equity. It's money that people do not have to pay back. So in terms of de-risking uh, from the public sector side, we're de-risking investments from pr the private sector like Victoria's organization. Um, the fact that some of our um, innovators have gone through USAID vetting or any other donor vetting, I believe that kind of gives that organization and the innovation and the idea some credibility. Um, and sometimes I think private sector investors would see grant funding as kind of like a de-risking opportunity for themselves. So, or like, um, like a first loss guarantee, right? So, um, that's the role that we play, uh, at, at Div. Yeah. Thanks so much. To explore the idea of de-risking innovation a little bit further, Richard, can you share from your perspective how that starts at the very beginning during the design phase? And how does co-creation with all stakeholders involved play a role in designing solutions with the greatest likelihood of success? Sure. So at Collaborate Up, our mission is to accelerate collaboration among companies, nonprofits, and governments whenever they want to take on a really tough challenge. And we've run literally dozens of co-creation processes for USAID and for uh, all three sectors private sector, public sector, and civil society. And if I look across all of those different experiences, I see a few principles that stand out that really will help to drive co-creation. And I think we've actually heard them on the panel today. The first one is to try to find the shared interest. Where does the shared interest lie amongst the three different uh, groups? And if I return to the wisdom of Doc Mabila, when I was talking to Doc about the role for innovation and conservation, he shared with me uh, some survey data that they had from local community members. And there was a quote that stood out to me. A woman said, the rhino has its own helicopter, its own doctor, and its own security guard. Maybe when all the rhinos are gone, we'll have those things too. And it really stuck with me that what I care about as a conservation person in the case of Bukanao and the project we were doing with Kamonics in Southern Africa is not what she cares about. And so when Doc is going around to these different communities, he's not talking to them about conservation. He's talking to them about how to start hair salons and small businesses and clean up soccer pitches. You might think that there's no connection between that and saving the rhino, but there is. And Doc has found it. So we have to be open, as I think, uh, as Grace told us, we have to be open and have an open door to all kinds of different innovation. And we have to be willing to think differently about how we're approaching the problems. Secondly, we really do need to de-risk these ideas. And we heard for, uh, also from Grace about the importance and the role that, uh, that the private sector, I'm sorry, the public sector can play in doing that on the financial side. We did a, a, a report last year on disinformation and misinformation. And one of the things we found was that investors tend to add a 30% premium, an unnecessary 30% risk premium to investments in Latin America and up to a 50% unnecessary risk premium to investments in Africa. So we have a role to play on all three sides to help reduce the information overload or the misinformation that's out there about how risky these investments actually are. And then I think what we heard from uh, Lizzie is the importance of being able to incorporate in co-creation and co-design the views of all of the different stakeholders involved. The core principle behind co-creation is that the more that we engage with the community in advance, the more likely that we are to ensure adoption afterwards. That's the basic principle behind human-centered design, design thinking, system thinking, all of these different schools of thought. If we engage people early and often, they're more likely to use, be involved with, and support whatever the solution we're trying to come up with. And lastly, I think we heard from Victoria about the need for having an ecosystem that supports 
our entrepreneurs and our innovators. And we need to build that starting in school, but we need to continue that throughout. And when we host programs, when USAID or implementing partners host challenges and other innovation competitions, we have to not only support the winners, we have to support the losers as well. And make sure that those people who didn't get funding still feel like they're getting something out of it so that we can continue to create a sustaining ecosystem where people are willing to take risk, both on the innovator side and on the investor side. Thank you, that was an excellent summary, appreciate it. Um, finally, last question, um, from me at least. We heard at the end of the fireside chat about the challenges Tatiana's faced in her entrepreneurial journey, as well as her recommendations to potential funders and partners. So as we wrap up this portion of the panel, can you each share a few final thoughts on the practical steps public and private sectors can be taking to help ensure innovators like Tatiana and Sabira thrive? Okay. Start with you. Sure. Um, practical steps. I think number one is really take the time to contextualize and understand your problem before you jump into solutions. One of the number one mistakes we see is that people come to the table wanting to advocate a specific solution without really understanding the problem. There's a great book called Lean Startup um, where they have this tool called a, 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 a business model canvas. We adopted, we adapted it to create a collaboration canvas. It's basically a series of questions that takes you through trying to understand your problem. So that when I heard Tiana, she's really spent a lot of time understanding what's going on in that market and what are needed, what the needs of her consumers are. Oftentimes, I don't think we really fully understand what is the problem we're trying to solve before we start crafting the solution. And I'll build on that and just say that, and then looking at all of the problems holistically, understanding you know where each partner can can add value and where they can plug in to solve a challenge. There's there's no point in helping an entrepreneur to try and get their business off the ground if the regulatory framework isn't ever going to allow them to grow. So you really need to look at it from all angles and understand where each potential partner, public, private, academic, uh, incubator, donor can can help solve key challenges because otherwise you'll face different um, stopping points at different parts of the ecosystem. I think uh, problem-led uh, solutioning is uh, on point, but also I would like to highlight um, market viability. Uh, a lot of times um, when we read, we get about 1,200 applications a year and we read every single one of them. And uh, sometimes innovators don't actually explain what their innovation is very well because they're in it all the time. It's in their head. So they just think that it's obvious to everybody reading their application that, they, that they're that they clearly uh, explaining their innovation. But also um, people don't actually explain how much something they're, they're thinking costs or how much they've made in terms of revenue. So like market viability is something that we look at very seriously, kind of like what Victoria had said. So I, I, I would highly encourage anybody who applies to, to DIV to kind of hit on those points. So yeah, uh, three things. One is refine your pitch. Uh, know how to tell your story, like what Grace said, right? So that's your uh, first uh, step to success. Two is join an ecosystem. Um, such as the many ones that are represented on the stage, including Extreme Tech Challenge, where you will access uh, mentorship, you will learn best practices, you will learn, you know, all sorts of different components of building, uh, you know, your great company. Um, so I, I think that's there's so many different support systems and programs out there, and go out and participate. And those are, you know, great advice, and, and also you'll be able to meet people that can help you, you know, build those relationships that take it forward. And the last piece is, um, you think, understand the problem uh, problem that you're solving um, and, you know, network and uh, try to get into startup competitions where you can get on the biggest stages in the world because global visibility is going to help you amplify your purpose. Now we're, we'd like to hear from our global audience, and we have some questions that were submitted online before the event, um, and we'll have time to take a few questions from uh, the audience here today as well. So the first question that we received um, in advance uh, was that investors will usually have some reservations about funding an untested new idea, no matter how groundbreaking it may seem. What are some of the deal breakers for investors or funders that will reduce the el eligibility of startups to receive early stage investment? And anyone's welcome to, to take that. Um, 
for mm -hmm. development and innovation ventures, even for our stage one, even though we say we call that stage initial pilot, it does, we don't fund ideas. So if it's just an idea that you've come up with, like Tatiana's fog idea that she kind of kept in the drawer for three years, right? Um, uh, we actually need a little bit of evidence that your idea actually works. So we fund post post ideation, post prototype. And so for even for stage one, I would highly recommend um, you coming with some level of evidence that your idea actually works, that there is a market for it, et cetera. If I could just add to that, I mean, we run a program in blended finance in the Caribbean. And what we're hearing from our investors is, it's something that I, I was listening for in Tatiana's pitch and I clearly heard recurring revenue. Uh, if you don't, in order to do what Grace is saying, which is to prove that your thing works, that's to an investor, that is the demonstrable evidence that it works. Do you have a path or a model that's going to uh, produce recurring revenue? And then to add to that, what would be appealing to VC investors are, are you addressing a, a large market? Um, so that will tell us about the potential of this company going on to become big businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, second question. What are the key steps to scaling a startup? I got uh, three, three points here. One is lower the cost of friction to adoption. Uh, second is coming up with a repeatable um, process, replicable process. And then third is um, the process has to be scalable as well. So that's how you're going to get from you know, zero to infinite. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, Div has been around for 12 years. We were founded in 2010. Uh, we've made over 200 and I think 65 awards now in, in our 12 years. And, and um, we've done kind of like a retrospective, like 10 year study. And the two pathway to scale is either, you know, market based solution, right? So you're charging uh, and having the recurring revenue um, for, for your product or service. But it's also public sector scale. So do you have a solution that the government, like the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Agriculture, can take up and use their own government funding to actually scale it? And, and that level of scaling could actually get to more people. And so um, I, I don't know if that like makes sense for everybody, but you know, those are the two scale models that we see have, 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 uh, where our grantees who have reached over a million beneficiaries have used. And I would say in both of the, the, the two questions that we've gotten, there's a key point of understanding where you are on your journey and what type of financing, investment, and support you need at each stage and where to find it. Um, the, the startup fund that we developed is giving grants of $25,000 to $50,000, which is obviously at a very different scale than what DIV is offering. And, 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 and XTC. So, and, and so therefore we are fun, funding ideas. And so it's, I think it's good for innovators and entrepreneurs to understand kind of where to look for the right type of financing and, and who's offering it based on where they are in their journey. Okay. I'd love to open it up to the audience here in DC to ask if anybody has a question and we have someone with a mic who will come to you. Hi, my name is Audrey, and I'm the co-CEO of the social enterprise B-Girl. We do menstrual health globally, and I, I really appreciate the conversations we've had already today about you know, what an entrepreneur looks like and touching on the, the way that systems have been set up to support particular types of entrepreneurs. For example, we know about the, the data about how little VC capital still goes to women and underrepresented entrepreneurs. And so I wanted to ask, where do you see opportunities within funding systems to evolve, to start to actually make these meaningful shifts in terms of where the funding is going towards supporting entrepreneurs who maybe haven't necessarily had those opportunities in the past? Thank you. I would say let's put more resources to help these underrepresented, underrepresented entrepreneurs to be better entrepreneurs, right? Giving them mentorship, giving them coaching so that they, uh, so they, they do build companies and, and businesses that are attractive to investors. I would add to that that um, it's not just where the money is going, it's also where the money is coming from. Um, and what we're, we're working with several um, funds here in the United States that are led by 
um, either by black people or by other underrepresented, underrepresented communities where people who have achieved generational wealth and want to help others achieve generational wealth are looking to create those kinds of uh, either venture back funds or innovation funds so that the money, they, that they can look at things with those eyes and help to see uh, the, the next generation of innovator uh, and support them. Another question in the front? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Muir, and I love this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, so my first question is two questions. Um, one is for Elizabeth, and then the next one is for anyone who wants to answer. Um, Elizabeth, I hear that you're funding creative industries in Moldova, and I would love to know what those creative industries are. And then my next question is, um, do you think that USAID is starting to focus on creative industries worldwide and part of their development approach? And if so, what sort of things are you seeing and how is it funded? Thanks. Sure, yeah. So in Moldova, we're funding a variety of creative industries. We take a pretty broad approach when looking at them. This includes, and we include digital media as a subset of that and media as a whole. So we're looking at um, art, publishing, marketing, architecture, um, VR and AR, immersive installation design, uh, new media, um, animation, and uh, a ton of different um, kind of sub-verticals within the creative industries. And uh, this was identified under the previous sector competitiveness programming as a high potential sector for Moldova uh, based on kind of uh, the existing creative uh, roots within the, the country and the skills that um, that the professionals have, but also in looking at the global trends and that like Korea tech. So looking at how much money is going into the digital media industry, whether it's with streaming platforms and uh, special effects with films and overall kind of how, um, how much content is being created on a regular basis. This is a huge industry and one that um, a country like Moldova with a lot of tech capacity and creative capacity can really um, tap into. And so we have seen, um, you know, donors supporting uh, these programs uh, worldwide, but I would say it's also becoming a trend, especially in Europe, for governments to be putting more sort into their creative industries because they've been recognizing that they're not just a source of, you know, cultural wealth, but also a potential economic wealth. And so, for example, in, in Moldova, we were able uh, this year to launch three new bachelor's programs at three universities, one in animation, one in game design, and one in um, new media. And we had an overwhelming amount of interest from students. And so we really see these areas in which you can combine, you know, tech skills and uh, creative interests uh, to create new career paths as a really exciting one. Um, so Div has not funded this organization, but I earlier this week I met with a the CEO of Industry. It's a nonprofit in India, and um, I do know that they were funded by USAID India uh, to and and um, Industry basically works with female entrepreneurs that use uh, sometimes use natural resources like bamboo uh, to create like artisanal craft uh, products that get sold uh, in America and in Europe and things like that. So um, there, there is quite a bit of funding. And apparently that was like natural resources funding. So it wasn't a gender or a climate uh, fund. It was a natural resources fund because they were using bamboo uh, products or bamboo as, as the, um, the material. <laughs> and one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, we also see creative industries and many of the industries we worked in, we work in as, as an enabler for others uh, by leveraging kind of the creative capacities of firms to then promote Moldova's tourism sector, for example, or to uh, create events that have amazing uh, immersive experiences involved with them or to um, really use these uh, sectors as ways to promote others. Um, it's been an exciting way to amplify the impacts that uh, of, of other work in other sectors. I think we have time for one more question. There's another one from the audience. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Asuma Brennan, and um, I recently joined uh, Kimonix and um, and went on a capture trip um, uh, to East Africa. And um, uh, one question that I have um, uh, is, what advice can you give um, to companies like Axel that I uh, met with, um, and uh, they're having trouble, um, well, they struggle with finding local invest investment partners um, uh, because their um, product is expensive on the local market. Um, any advice from Div would be helpful. Thank you. Did you, did you say Axel? Yeah, um, currently under review, so I don't think I can really make a comment on this uh, platform. <laughs> but we are familiar with them. Um, Axel has, uh, you're talking about the Soko Fresh? Yeah. Soko Fresh is renewable, it's solar powered cold storage. So, agriculture, um, uh, uh, reducing post, uh, post harvest loss. Um, and so, Socofresh has been funded by uh, another peer fund uh, at USAID called a Water Energy for Food. Um, they have applied to DIV and their application is under review. So, um, yeah. <laughs> We do have time for one more question, if anybody else had, had one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to, uh, to the panelists. My name is Vali Samar, and I work with Richard, a collaborator. Uh, recently, we had a, um, a, a, a co-creation um, uh, session in Liberia, where I was a facilitator for uh, the USAID WASH project. Uh, as part of that, the project intends to create opportunities for local entrepreneurs who are in the, like, actually manufacturing sanitation products. One of the challenges that, that kind of, you know, um, that we noticed was the issue of competition uh, with importers. So, and, and uh, those who are importing, uh, you know, like a sanitation product, and those who are actually manufacturing sanitation product from local materials. So the preference would be, you know, we're kind of like, obviously for local producers, but they face da in like a daily competition with those who are importing materials from either India or China or areas and I, I like, uh, so basically, what advice would you, you know, like I give them to kind of like how they face, how we kind of, you know, cope in the face of competition. And secondly, one of the suggestions I kind of came up was government, uh, like government protection, whether government can put tariff on these imported materials or whether kind of like reduce cost of, um, uh, for, for local uh, manufacturers sort of that, like, you know, for you know, grace and uh, lace from your experience, like what have been some mechanisms that USAID has put in place to create some form of protection for these uh, local producers in the, uh, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Well, I'm going to use the solar industry as an example. Um, I was in solar um, in the late 2000s, and initially it was a very expensive solution, right? But then, you know, ultimately the purpose is, is developing a cleaner world and a more um, renewable world. Um, so, ultimately, so in the beginning. It was propped up by a lot of government funding and subsidies and, and non-dilutive. But ultimately, the, the, the industry has to uh, really look at how to scale and bring down the cost of, of production, cost of that solution. So while the government subsidy could be an initial you know, rocket fuel to, to intentionally um, nurture the growth of this industry, but I think ultimately the, the startups themselves need to figure out a long-term scalable model where you can bring down the cost of, um, of, of that solution. I would think if you're a local solution manufacturing locally, um, your COGS will be a lot, a lot lower. So wouldn't you be more competitive in terms of pricing than imports? Unless it's super cheap products from China. I don't know. Cement, right? Yeah. So you have to buy cement, and oh, the cost okay. of cement is high on the market. So you have yes. to use cement, you have to use sand, and all that. Yes. If you kind of put all those costs together, yeah. it costs a lot more to produce than to kind of buy just a unit of toilet seat. Yeah. So DIV has funded several sanitation, like container-based toilets, or you know, alternative to pit latrine type or sewer uh, sanitation solutions. Um, uh, I do think uh, paying for 
import fees like vats and things like that could could be a little bit uh, could reduce your, the company's like competitiveness, right? And so, um, and I don't know if this is for every USA funded project. I'm actually working on a, an issue like this for another grantee of ours, where I believe if um, U.S. government funding is used to deliver a product or a service, um, the VAT fees should be exempt or reduced or something like that. Um, but I think it's like a per country basis, like what, what the U.S. government has in terms of agreement with that local, with that country. So I'm, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, we so we funded plenty of sanitation um, uh, uh solutions and as victoria mentioned like grant funding could be kind of like a subsidy or a way to reduce costs um in, in some aspects so perhaps they can apply to us i would um from a broader perspective um i would say that when we go through a co-creation process there are always and stakeholders that are at odds about something that they're either in competition or they don't agree with the goals or, or how to go about achieving them and so i think it's about understanding that market is the market big enough to have both importers and local producers and if so then how can they potentially collaborate you know can the importers help you know provide supplies to the local producers and then they have a new client as well and so it's about kind of thinking about it a bit differently in terms of like how can you take competitors and potentially find ways that they can benefit from one another. And it's a long process and one that takes a lot more than, you know, one or two sessions, but establishing kind of longer term relationships and understanding of the market and the players. I think that note of co-creation is great to end on. Um, so I want to thank you for uh, attending today to our global audience and for all of those great questions. I want to thank our panelists, Richard, Elizabeth, Grace, and Victoria, um, as well as Tatiana and Sabir for joining us today. Um, as the world continues to tackle the confluence of conflict, conflict, climate, and COVID, as well as other issues of sustainability, it's critical that we catalyze innovation, particularly by supporting locally led innovators. We know that communities have better recognition and understanding of the solutions they need, and the public and private sectors should be guided by that experience and contribute the expertise, funding, and resources necessary to bring those solutions to scale. For that reason, we're excited to be officially launching Commonix's Innovation Playbook today to share our experience with others, which you can find a link to on our event website and on commonix.com. The playbook is a guide to a range of innovation and scaling approaches and methodologies, some of which we've discussed today, that can help us meet the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for coming in. And I, I think you'll agree with me, this was an incredibly rich conversation, wonderful opportunity for all of us to get together. And given, as I said at the beginning, the staggering deficit that we have to face in terms of reaching the SDGs, a conversation that we'll have to continue. Thank you.